Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the organisers for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm filling in for Professor Sonia marshall Gradesnik, who is unwell and can't make it. Um, but if I may just deviate from my prepared talk just for a couple of minutes to try and address some of the questions that came out of that uh, slightly heated discussion before. Um, I'm a public health physician, so my day job is managing outbreaks of disease in the community. But because of the close working relationship with the medical school, I give lectures and so on, I also have a role with the research that we do in ME, um, I, I bring a perspective as to uh, what is the prevalence and incidence of this disease in the community. And what we've done is, as part of the design for the new research unit at Griffith University, which Sonia's people will move into in about three weeks' time, has a dedicated ME clinical and research capacity within this building. Sonia's lab is up here, takes up half of that floor there. And down here about the third floor uh, is a three-bed dedicated 24-hour unit um, targeted for uh, people with ME who can come and be observed over a long period of time. Uh, when I say long period, I mean over 24 hours minimum. Uh, and if there's a greater clinical need, they can be transferred to the new university teaching hospital, which is located just under that icon there, and that will be opening in a couple of months as well. So what we have is a very integrated system of, of research, specialised treatment and care for people with ME, and uh, access to all the resources of a university teaching hospital. Now, that seems to me a really simple idea, and I just don't know why that's not picking up kind of momentum here as well. But um, perhaps I could move on now and talk about uh, why, as a public health uh, physician, it's very important that we find immunological and molecular markers that are not only in a clinical sense. For example, my, my uh, patient load is the one million population of Gold Coast uh, in Australia, which doubles to two million during the, the holiday period. And um, my role is to uh, support GPs uh, in understanding outbreaks of disease and outbreaks such as ME when they occur, uh, in my view, are no different from outbreaks of pandemic influenza or whatever. They have to be identified and managed in, in a very professional way. So moving forward, um, some of the uh, material I'll be presenting today is under publication and you'll be able to follow this over the next few weeks or months. Um, now, just to give a, a sort of an overview, as you know, the CFS uh, ME case definition, it, it's a multi-system illness. There are clearly factors operating throughout the entire body physiology uh, to, to impact uh, on, on people's lives and, and with a very devastating effect. We're just focusing on the immunological area today, and what I'm aiming to do is to show how the bridge between the innate immune system and the adaptive or acquired immune system has very consistent and very observable changes. Uh, and some of these are first in the world that's been reported and we're very keen to have other groups uh, come in and, and try and validate or, or contradict our studies and that, that's fine. Uh, and to look at some very specialised analyses we're doing uh, with uh, areas like microRNA. So let's just deal now with some of the stuff you probably already know about, with natural killer cell function and CD8 function. And these, uh, these killer cells operate by causing lysis or cell death in invading organisms. So the natural killer cell uh, will release um, molecules, uh, toxic molecules, perfins, granzymes, and so on, which then invade the target cell, producing apoptosis or cell death. That's, that's how they work. And when uh, a number of studies have confirmed the role of uh, impaired uh, natural killer cell functioning, and in fact when you dilute the effector to target ratios, we see a consistent impairment in natural killer cell function uh, in, the, in the shaded area here. And, and this has been reported by others, I believe. I think we're the first to actually look at this over a period of time, over six months and 12 months. And what we're trying to say here is this, this is not a flash in the pan. This is not a, a single time point phenomenon. This is a sustained, demonstrable, significant impairment in natural killer cell function. 
Additionally, we looked at uh, CD107A, which is a, a marker for natural killer cell lysis, just to see that we were on the right track. And uh, the same uh, impairment, uh, in this case, the CFS ME group are in the non-shaded area, and uh, there are significant uh, differences in CD107 uh, expression. So moving forward in terms of how these perforins and granzymes work, the perforins, as the name might suggest, perforate the cell, and granzymes uh, do their work to uh, basically assassinate the target cell. And this is done through receptors. And when we break this down in terms of the three groups, perforin, granzyme A and granzyme B, the uh, deficit we see very clearly was in the granzyme B group. Now, when we look at um, the markers CD56 dim and CD56 bright, which have certain roles in terms of cytokine production, uh, which is uh, part of the uh, process of addressing invading cells, that there's, a again, a very specific subset that's affected. It's the CD56 bright area, which has significant impairment in function as opposed to the CD56 dim. And in terms of certain receptors, such as natural killer cell receptors, we also see uh, changes in the CUR3 receptor here. And these are all associated uh, activities that collectively are responsible for being able to uh, attack and, and immobilise an invading uh, infection. So quite clearly, our, our research here is showing us that there are a number of dimensions uh, in which uh, there is impaired function uh, in the patient group. If we move now to uh, CD8 cells, moving more into the adaptive immune system uh, in the uh, T helper uh, areas, um, in the T cell areas, you can see that there are also consistent changes over time at zero months and six months. And remember that question about seasonality came up this morning, and that was the reason we do this, is that we take it at, uh, at least two or three time points during the year, so we're able to offset any uh, bias that may have occurred through influenza seasons and so on. And the point being the CD8 cell, uh, which is also a, um, uh, an, a, a cell for assassinating incoming um, bacteria and so on, uh, is, is compromised. And neutrophils uh, also function in a phagocytic capacity through a phenomenon known as respiratory burst, amongst other things. And the cell uh, targets the, uh, the cell it wishes to uh, immobilise. And by triggering a number of pathways through reactive oxygen species here and the NADPH uh, system here, is able to bring about a, a kind of a toxic environment within the targeted cell uh, and uh, that's a very important mechanism in, uh, in host defence. And what we found is in ME patients, if we look at uh, the respiratory burst specifically in the ME CFS patients, that is profoundly reduced. Uh, we couldn't see so much uh, changes in terms of phagocytic function, but in that respiratory burst function would certainly indicate there's a significant abnormality here. And just looking at some antigens which are expressed, the HNAs, human neutrophil antigens, uh, there are at least two uh, that are abnormally expressed, uh, HNA2 and HNA5. So again, this is kind of putting more strength to the arm in terms of the uh, diagnostic capacity that exists to uh, try and more exclusively diagnose this patient group. I'm going to turn now to microRNAs. We touched on this last year. But uh, the microRNA family, very small um, uh, length uh, nucleotides, and they're manufactured in the, uh, in the nucleus, exported into the cytoplasm, uh, sliced and diced in ways that then can then act on translation and uh, messenger RNA uh, activity. So uh, in summary, the, the microRNA family, there's probably about 2,000 micro, microRNAs uh, in the human, of which probably two or three hundred only uh, are really known about, and uh, very little, very much less is really understood about them. 
But what we did, because we could, in other words, just by looking in bloods at uh, NK cells and CD8 cells, uh, you will see a number of microRNAs here, of which are, are, are quite a number of them have shown significant differences. So we're getting to the point of getting almost a, I, I can't say it's a unique fingerprint because we haven't done studies with other autoimmune diseases and we'd like to do this with MS and SLE and a number of other conditions as well to see whether this is unique or whether this is shared across other diseases. And quite clearly this has implications for whether this may be an autoimmune disease that we're dealing with. Um, so as you can see, uh, quite a number of microRNAs uh, are changed uh, in their expression. And now looking at the CD8 cells, uh, just uh, micro... Uh, 21 uh, is consistent with the previous slide as well. So there's something happening at the microRNA expression level. Moving now into the adaptive immune system, I won't go into all the uh, uh, T helper uh, cell types, but you'd be familiar with Th1, Th2, Th17, and the Treg group here. Uh, and these are the different uh, transcriptional factors uh, associated with them. And we're particularly interested in uh, the Treg group and FOXP3, which traditionally has been seen as a, as a marker, as a transcription factor, as a unique and in inverted commas marker of Tregs. And we presented this uh, data last year where we showed that um, the characterization of these cells is CD4, CD25, FOXP3, um, but we added CD127 because of the uh, the purists would argue that you can get FOXP3 in other cells. It may not be a unique marker for a Treg, but a, as a shorthand version, it probably is a, a reasonable marker of Tregs. And we added CD127 and basically got identical results. So we're highly confident that this particular cell type is upregulated in MECFS in, in our patient group. And you can say, well, what's, what's the purpose of this and what do Tregs do? And traditionally, they are upregulated as a way of suppressing uh, inflammatory mechanisms. And it's believed they do this by uh, being essentially factories for cyclic AMP, which they transfer directly to other cells, and that acts as an anti-inflammatory mechanism. I'm sure it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's the kind of the shorthand version. We also look, wanted to look at gamma delta T cells. They're a very interesting cell type because they basically straddle the um, uh, innate and adaptive immune systems and for a whole bunch of reasons they're professional antigen presenting cells so they'd be very important in terms of whether any um, molecular patterns are being uh, represented or uh, presented to the immune system and while we found an elevation that was not of statistical significance but we're going to this is the first time we've done it so we're going to go back over it again and see if we can get any greater clarity uh, around that particular cell type. Moving on to B cells, uh, without going into too much detail here, this is the evolution of the B cell through um, to uh, memory B cells and plasmoblast plasma cells, which are generally associated with antibody uh, excretion. And in the B cell phenotypes that we've looked at, we found there's a relative deficit in the immature B cells uh, and the CFS group here, are uh, MECFS, are in the shaded area, uh, that there was an increase in memory cells, also an increase in plasma cells, which are the antibody, largely the antibody uh, excreting cells, uh, but that was not of statistical significance. Uh, but again, uh, maybe where the smoke was fire, we would go back and want to do that again and invite other researchers to try and uh, replicate those sort of studies. Uh, the plasmacytoid dendritic cells, dendritic cells uh, are professional antigen-presenting uh, cells, and they're very important, particularly for this group over here, because of this uh, TOL9 receptor here, which uh, recognises CPG, cytosine phosphate guanine motifs uh, in bacteria, but also in endogenous um, genetic material. And um, that is a mechanism to, uh, to recognise uh, genetic material as foreign and to uh, present it to the immune system as, as required. And we looked at this particular cell type. Uh, in this case, the CFSME group are in the unshaded area and in the uh, post of myeloid uh, DCs in, uh, in this group, uh, we found a significant um, underpresentation of that cell type. So it was very interesting to hear a number of the speakers before 
uh, talk about the need for some specific diagnostic tests and what, what are the paradigms that operate and, and this, this tension that exists between a, uh, a, a psychiatric paradigm and a, um, a proper biological paradigm and, and um, we've just taken a stab at doing this and uh, suggesting that perhaps not, in not all cases do you see ME following infection, but for the purpose of this discussion, uh, pathogen enters the body and, is rec and recognition by the immune system is commenced. The innate and adaptive immune components are initiated and in the innate and, uh, uh, immune system we have demonstrated consistently changes and, and many of these are for the first time in neutrophils, natural killer cells, gamma delta T cells, uh, nitric oxide, we need to do more work on, uh, but our Norwegian colleagues, I think, are, are moving down that path, and in plasma cytoid uh, dendritic cells. In the adaptive immune system, we found changes in B cells, including memory and plasma cells, T cells, particularly the T reg group, which are, as I said, a major modulator of inflammatory mechanisms, possibly through cyclic AMP. And uh, in the Th1, Th2 types, I haven't gone into the speci specifics of that, um, and also cytotoxic CD8 cells, which we've also shown uh, significant impairment in their function. So quite clearly there is a disorder of pathology response in, in both the innate and the adaptive. In fact, across the entire immune system are we seeing uh, consistent and replicable uh, changes in, uh, in the capacity uh, of uh, ME CFS patients to deal with infection, for argument's sake. And part of the mechanisms that are involved here, the uh, impairment of respiratory burst, uh, granzymes, particularly granzyme B function. Uh, we've thrown a few other things into the mix. We've shown changes in microRNA. I believe that's the first in the world uh, report and a number of other functions. So trying to put some hypothesis together on this, uh, we would argue that there's a, a dysregulation which is initiated and then maintained through the innate and acquired immune systems, uh, possibly involving antibodies, uh, and, and all of that together, and I'm really paraphrasing quite dreadfully here, uh, a number of hallmarks of autoimmunity. The, the, the part that sticks out as an anomaly to us, and um, it was uh, <coughs> exciting to hear our colleagues from Spain um, uh, yesterday comment also on their finding of elevated Tregs. Uh, we'd normally expected an autoimmune uh, disease for the Tregs to be uh, uh, depressed in, in their function, allowing more reactive Th1 or Th17 uh, type responses to occur, which uh, are the hallmarks of, of autoimmune processes. So we're actually getting quite a paradoxical uh, effect here, but we, we can't explain that either, and we're really looking forward to further uh, scientific investigation of all of that. So trying to put that into some overarching uh, diagram, and I'll just try and just pull out the key points here. It's a bit hard to commit to memory, but uh, you've got the microRNA uh, abnormalities, which we've uh, seen, um, uh, particularly in the natural killer cell functioning, uh, the deficit of uh, perfin and granzymes, particularly granzyme B, um, and uh, leading through into changes in the memory B cell compartment, uh, changes in the plasma cytoid dendritic cells and an up, up regulation of T regs and, and other changes in the T helper uh, compartment as well. So we're still trying to put together what this paradigm means, but uh, I think you'd agree there's a significant number of changes across the entire immune compartment that uh, are really quite tantalising for, for further research. Um, and, and anyone who suggests that uh, this might be fixed by exercise therapy uh, should probably be deregistered, I think. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank our sponsors for uh, fantastic support for us over a number of years, and these are the people who do all the work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Da. Thank you. One question, yes. Yeah, yes, please. Um, I must say, that is the most promising positive talk I think we've had all day. Absolutely wonderful, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I am a novice at this illness, but I have got an MSc in molecular medicine. Yep. And for my thesis, I worked on schizophrenia. Um, you would made a comment there, which I don't quite understand. You, you talked about bio biologic and psychiatric. 
And I, as a, at a molecular level, I'm not sure I would differentiate between the two, because surely both these um, problems start from the basis of molecular. Oh, sure. Look, I wasn't trying... I, I agree with you. I'm not trying to diminish the role of molecular mechanisms in psychiatry. I think I was using a shorthand paradigm of those who would just say that MECFS is a psychiatric disorder. And I'm saying that that, that is not the case, that there is clear derangement in the immune system across the so many compartments there that it's irrefutable, uh, although this, this is still early uh, publications, much of this work, and we, we obviously would like other groups to follow, follow that. One last one, Don. Uh, as you say, do we have very similar results on uh, T-Rex cells, CD80 cells and NK cells? And in our cohort in Spain, we try to correlate the immunological alterations with the severity of the disease, but the severity was very homogeneous mm. in our patients, so there was no clear association between both parameters. Uh, and I was wondering whether you could that, uh, could did some of these associations in, between the immunological parameters and the severity of the disease in your, co in your patients? Yeah, thank you, Julia. Uh, look, that's an excellent question. We actually did look at this. Um, we were one of the first groups to, to um, well, as you know, the severe group of ME are a very abandoned uh, group of people. And um, in almost any other disease, the more severe the disease, the more hospital attention you get, the more investigations, the more expert care you get. Uh, with ME, it's entirely the opposite. <clears throat> the worse the disease, the more the isolation. So we deliberately um, went into the homes of uh, what we'd call the severe group, and we use various criteria for d deciding that, and uh, took the bloods. And we did a number of other tests which I haven't shown here, and particularly with uh, influenza, seasonal influenza vaccine. Um, and I don't want to make this too long-winded, but there are certainly differences in the way that uh, ME patients respond to seasonal influenza. And, and there is a seasonal influenza vaccine. And there's certainly a lot of anecdotal reporting that patients would prefer to avoid uh, seasonal influenza vaccine. Now, as a public health professional, uh, that would be the opposite of my recommendations. I would say that the, the, the effects of seasonal influenza can be catastrophic with cardiomyopathies and a whole bunch of other very serious uh, complications. So that's an argument for another time. But to, to cut back to uh, Julia's point, uh, we really didn't find major differences in those immunological markers that I presented today between the moderate group and the severe group. Now, we can't completely explain that, but are, are we making a mistake by suggesting that there should be a correlation? Because remember at the outset I said this is a multi-system disease. There are neurological components, there are cardiovascular components, there are uh, gut components, urogenital components, uh, and the immunological system is only one part, a very important part, but only one part of, of the entire picture. So uh, the short answer, Julie, we can't explain that, uh, but uh, we would certainly be interested in, in further research in that area. Thanks very much, Don. Thank you indeed.